The church year shifts with St. Michael and all angels. We celebrated that two weeks ago. And that Sunday, as I said in the sermon, is a comfort to us to know that we have a God who leads his holy armies in defense of his people. And part of that battle was going to the cross to suffer and die for us, to win the victory, to silence the devil, defeat death, and to give our sorry flesh hope. And that hope is the resurrection. And with that Sunday, a decided shift occurs in the readings. And you could hear that today. Many places, most people have not, they are not accustomed to hearing Jesus and preach about the end of the world, about the consummation of the age. No, people are more used to hearing about a buddy Jesus who accepts you just as you are. There's no need to repent. Everything's been taken care for you. In fact, gets right down to it. Our society and most Christians today believe that, you know what, everybody gets in. Everybody gets into heaven so that when we hear Jesus say these words and teach about the kingdom of God, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People are a little taken aback. And that Jesus doesn't leave it there. He speaks to the reality of it. For many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, the call and the invitation of the gospel has gone out to many. But the many, though many are saved, the many is far greater than the many that receive. The multitude that no one could number, the rank on rank of saints, is far less than those who are not saved. And indeed, God's ways are his, and they are not like ours. Justice must be done. His word must stand. Grace has come But you have to heed the invitation. You have to submit yourself to his will and to his word. And part of that submitting to his will and his word is heeding the words of repentance. For that is what Jesus preached. It is. The very first thing that came out of his mouth after he was baptized is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The call into the kingdom is one to heed his word, to return to the Lord, forsaking our wicked ways, seeking him while he may yet be found. When his word is preached and his gifts are given, it is there that we should be, seeking what he offers, the grace of God for sinners, And indeed, he has abundantly pardoned. Not simply with a waving of a hand and a telling you it's all okay. No, he did so with actions. He did so himself. By becoming one of us, living under the law as all of us do, living it perfectly in will and deed and in life, and submitting himself to death, though he did not deserve it. He went to the cross to suffer on our behalf. And from his blood, the abundant mercy of God comes, the grace of God is poured out, and peace between God and men is established. Isaiah sees forward into the future, and he sees the messianic kingdom. We see this this passage from Isaiah fulfilled in the life and the ministry and the teachings of Christ. 
Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. He fed the 5,000 and then the 4,000. He proclaimed the Beatitudes. He went and healed the sick, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the leper. He raised the dead. And those that should have known the Scriptures, well, they were filled not with an earnest desire for the coming of the Messiah, but rather they were desirous of a Messiah of their own making, one born from their own image, one that would be like them. And what is that? To be those who would outwardly fulfill the law, but not, but, but being deluded by the, the very idea that they could be righteous by the law, even though the scriptures that they knew, the scriptures that they taught, the scriptures that they sought to live showed very clearly that you cannot fulfill the law by your own works, which is why God set up the entire sacrificial system, pointing forward to the Messiah who would come, the blood of lambs, goats, and heifers, and pigeons. Countless numbers of them gave up their lives for the sins of the people of Israel. But none of that is actually what took away the sins of the people. All of it pointed forward to the Messiah who would come, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. But when he is standing before them, when he is preaching, when he is doing all of the mighty deeds that God sent him to do, all that they do is scoff and question and call him a blasphemer. Call him Beelzebul because he didn't match what they wanted. After all, Jesus is, he's wrecking their lives, really. They are the center of the life of Israel. Not the Word, not the Torah, but it's them. It was all about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And anyone who didn't live up to them was looked down upon and thought that the kingdom did not belong to them. So when the king comes, they do not heed the invitation. Though God had sent many before, and they had refused the invitation over and over and over again, to the point that half the kingdom was destroyed, the other half left for a time. But then the city and the walls torn down and the people of Judah taken into exile out of mercy for the Gentiles because God's word must be fulfilled. And God's word and promise was that from the stump of Jesse would come forth a shoot. And that shoot is Jesus. Judah. Through him, the Messiah would come. So Judah must be, must stay, is not completely destroyed. But they came back, many of them penitent, but then others, I suspect, not so much. Misread the scriptures and established for themselves, essentially, is a new religion. Religion of works, not of grace, not of faith. One of works righteousness. And so when Jesus comes and he points out to them that they're not righteous, no, not one, they don't much like it. So what do they do? They killed the prophets before him, then they killed John, and then they killed him. They can't stop the kingdom. No grave could hold him, and he was raised from the dead. Indeed, the wedding feast is ready. 
beast of burden has been slaughtered. But he was raised. And it is to the wedding feast of the Son of God that we are all invited. We are all invited to this feast. And heeding the invitation, we must heed his word. Calling us to repentance, calling us to faith, calling us to the grace of God. And in that, that is a celebration. Because prior to this, we might have been diluted into thinking that we have to be righteous according to the law. But no, we cannot be. But Christ brought the kingdom of grace. This is not a lawless kingdom, but a kingdom of the will of God wrought and fulfilled in the person of Christ to set free sinners, to make them saints. And indeed, his servants did go out to call. His servants were sent out, and they gathered as many as they could find, and that work continues. As people are called into the kingdom of God, which is the church, calling a people that, that, that he did not know, to make Gentiles into the people of God, to bring them into the kingdom of the Son. And so now here you are, along with all of the saints of God, you who are both bad and good, saints and sinners, all, having been clothed, not with your own righteousness, because it is but a filthy rag, but rather having your robe washed in the blood of the Lamb, you have come to the waters of baptism. You've come and you've had your sins washed away. You have come to hear the preaching of Jesus. Called by the Spirit of God, you do seek him out where he can be found. He is not found exclusively in your heart because you're such a great person. No, he gets into your heart because of where he has said he will be. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. And what are we told to do in that instance? But to forgive, to announce the gospel of Christ, to tell people of his love for them. And you have heard this. You come here and you who have hungered and thirsted for righteousness and you have been satisfied and you will continue to be satisfied in this foretaste of the feast to come. Kneeling before the throne of God before you receiving on your tongues his body and blood for your sins. And in that holy meal, you are made holy. You are given the holiness of God. You are given a foretaste of that glorious wedding feast that is to come. A wonderful celebration of the grace of God. And in the church, the abundant grace of God and his pardon flows out upon you like a mighty rushing river of the grace of God flowing from the throne just as it is in the last book of the Bible. Dear Christians, the days are evil. These are gray and latter days. And so as I begun this sermon with speaking of St. Michael, I will end it speaking of the last Sunday of the church year, which is not too far away. Where Paul, I think, has what Jesus spoke of on that Sunday, or what we will speak of and what you've grown accustomed to hearing on that Sunday, of that beautiful parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. This is what Paul says. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is that? The will of the Lord is that you believe in God and believe in his Son, that you repent of your sins and that you be filled with faith because of the grace of Christ and the love of God 
having received that love, to go forth into your lives as his people, showing grace, the very grace that you have received in the church, in the kingdom, showing peace and showing mercy to those around you in word and deed. Because what you're doing there is you're sharing the kingdom. You're sharing Christ. And hopefully, through your invitation and your good deeds and your wonderful words of sharing Christ with someone else, that they too might be called into the church of God and be chosen. Chosen as those who have received the grace of God, whose hearts are filled with faith, and whose lives are lived in accordance with the life of Christ. Amen.